Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar series. I'm sorry so, for the delay. Um, we are we're having some connection issues. Our presenter is on the East Coast and is right in the middle of a snowstorm. So thank you so much for your patience while we got up and running. I'd like to welcome you all to the first of four webinars in UCI Division of Continuing Education's 10th Annual GATE webinar series. Today's topic is powerful strategies to enhance learning of gifted and highly able students. This session is being recorded and the archive will be posted to the UCI DCE On Demand Recordings page. My name is Lisa Huang and I'm a program manager here at UCI DCE. Below is a brief overview of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of Zoom features so you'll know how to submit questions to our featured speaker throughout the presentation. Next, I'll provide you with information about several GATE resources offered through UCI DCE, including our fully online GATE specialized studies program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and some upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins April 2nd. I will then hand it over to Nathan Levy as he will be presenting on today's topic, powerful strategies to enhance learning of gifted and highly able students. At the end of his presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. Finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send me any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to John from UCI Support and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Nathan regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the chat panel and we will address it at the end if we have time. And please be sure to send your questions to all panelists. Here's a brief overview of our GATE Specialized Studies program. It is offered fully online and consists of three required courses and three elective units. Our program is taught by a team of experienced instructors and is designed for individuals new to the field, as well as current GATE educators seeking professional development opportunities. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all nine units with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed request for certificate. The courses in the program range from $375 to $500 per course, depending on the unit value. You may take individual courses without pursuing the entire program. Here's a list of the required and elective courses that make up our GATE program. The topics covered in the program will help you develop a new skill set and gain a deeper understanding of this diverse group of students. When viewing the course schedule online, you'll notice that not all classes are offered every quarter, so please plan accordingly. Pay close attention to the unit value of each course because this dictates the course fee and how long each course will last. So for example, you can expect Learning Styles, a one unit course, to cost $375 and last three weeks online, while differentiated instruction, a three-unit course, costs $500 and lasts 10 weeks online. The nice thing about our program is that you can earn your certificate in as little as nine months, and you can choose elective topics of greatest interest to you. Here's a list of the courses we are offering in the upcoming spring quarter for the required course, differentiated instruction, and for elective courses, learning styles, and engaging students through technology. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee. The course schedule and enrollment information are also posted on our website. Enrollment is currently open, and students may enroll either online or by calling our student services office at the number provided. And we do encourage students to enroll at least two weeks prior to the start of a course. And this is just a special offer that we are offering to all of you as webinar participants um, to receive a 10% discount on online courses in the GATE Specialized Studies Program during spring quarter of 2018. Um, when you are registering either online or if you call our student services office, please enter the discount promo code GATE10. This offer does expire April 30th, 2018. And as you may already know, UCI DCE hosts an online GATE community that is free and open to the public. Please follow the directions on this slide to become a member and you will gain access to valuable resources, news, and events regarding GATE. 
Recordings of all of our past webinars are available through the community. We also provide individual courses specialized in services and the entire GATE Specialized Studies program on site or online to schools and districts at reduced prices. So depending on the cohort size, we offer 10, 15, or 20% off course fees. If you wish to learn more about our program and discuss your GATE training and professional development needs, please feel free to contact me. Last weekend, California Association for the Gifted, commonly referred to as CAG, hosted its annual conference in San Diego, California. UCIDCE is proud to be a credit provider for this event. In order to receive one unit of credit, individuals must have attended the CAG conference, submit an official enrollment form with payment, and write a reflection paper. This credit will appear on an official transcript that can be used as proof of professional development or toward requirements for salary advancement. If you attended the conference and are interested in this credit option, please feel free to email me for the official enrollment form. We are also offering a credit option for those of you who plan on attending all of the live webinars in this 10th annual series. In order to receive one unit of credit, individuals must attend all four live webinars, totaling four hours, submit an official enrollment form with payment, and turn in a reflection paper plus a lesson plan. You can email me at the address provided here on this slide for the enrollment form and requirements. To wrap up my portion of the presentation, hopefully you saw some courses that piqued your interest, and we hope that you will consider adding our fully online GATE program to your credentials. This slide has my contact information as well as my directors, so please feel free to contact us with any questions. Today's presenter is Nathan Levy, a highly sought after author and conference speaker. His stories with holes are among the most popular activities used in gifted programs. He is a former director of elementary education, school principal, and teacher of the gifted. We're very excited to have him logged in today to present on the topic, powerful strategies to enhance learning of gifted and highly able students. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Nathan so that he can further introduce himself and begin his presentation. And like I had mentioned at the beginning, Nathan is calling in from New Jersey and they are going through a pretty bad snowstorm right now. So um, we hope that everything runs smoothly during the presentation, but please bear with us if we have some um, technical or connection issues. Nathan, are you there? I'm here if you can hear me. Wonderful, yes, we can hear you. I, are you all ready for me? Yes, please feel free okay, to take it away. All right, hi everybody. Uh, for those of you who've heard me speak before, uh, you have some idea of who I am. For those of you who've never heard me speak before, uh, my name is Nathan Levy. I'm famous, just so you know. And I, I actually speak all over the world, as mentioned. But what I'm going to try to do, there's always, when people talk about gifted, there's always a question of who are they. And rather than give you a whole three credit course, I'm going to read you a poem that I wrote years ago. Uh, so we at least know who I'm talking about when I talk about gifted. There are those, and they're not few, who see a sky and just see blue. There are those, and strong their might, who look at stars and just see light. They will hear Brahms' symphony, and all they'll hear is melody. They look at me and even you, yet all they see is a face or two. But there are those, and they are few, who see much more than others do. They see beyond the blue of sky, beyond just lights, four stars will die. They hear much more than melody. They hear the heart of a symphony. And they can see beyond my face into a more secluded place. And because their cups hold a larger store, when they drink, they drink far more. So when people ask me, well, how do you identify gifted children? That's my answer. So when I speak to anybody, be it this way or person to person or in large groups where I'm doing interactive seminars, basically I share a few things from different books I've done to basically show them uh, what I think has to happen with gifted children. 
And we're going to be talking today about three types of thinking, which I'll summarize for you after. The books, for those who didn't know why I'm famous, I do write a series of books called Stories with Holes. We're going to put up a story now, Stories with Holes, that you can actually see that, see it. I think we're going to do that. I don't, okay, so if you look at this, there are 20 volumes of stories with holes. Each of the volumes have 20 stories just like this. But the books also have the answer. So the teacher or the parent or whoever's leading the group can just, basically, they have the answer and they, they have to read the story aloud. And the group has to try to solve it by asking questions. But the person who has the book can only say yes or no to the questions. So John and Mary are on the floor. There are pieces of broken glass and a puddle of liquid on the floor. Also, Mary is dead. So now you can ask questions, but remember the answer has to be yes or no. So somebody cannot say how many, why. So questions that people might ask. And the, the thing that you really do need to know, a story can take weeks to solve. I'm going to help you solve this in a few minutes because you don't have the chance to do it interactively. <laughs> Excuse me. So people might ask, is the liquid blood? The answer is no. Is the liquid water? The answer is yes. Is the glass from a window? No. Is it from a drinking glass? No. Now they can go on for days. The key to breaking through this is somebody might ask a John and Mary human. Well, the answer to that is no. So once, see, once you unlock a key, and this is true in almost all creative thinking, many of our great inventions came about because somebody saw something or connected. So we, we call this divergent thinking, which is a fancy name for creative thinking, thinking outside the box, open-ended thinking. So in order to solve this, I didn't have to teach you what a fish was. I didn't have to teach you that John is a cat. So you didn't have to learn that. But in order to solve it, you had to get away from the John and Mary are human names. So Stories with Holes has all these stories that are like that, that kids love. But what's hard for teachers of the gifted who aren't as well trained as they can be to know is kids need two things. Number one, they must learn how to work hard. And number two, they must learn to persevere. So when I do these with a group of kids or adults, I don't give them any hints. And in California and New Jersey, who are leaders of helping kids when they don't need help, that wasn't a compliment to either state. Uh, basically, our kids really need to learn to work on their own, but our kids have become masterful at getting adults to do the work for them. And we really want the kids to learn, well, you're gonna have to persevere, otherwise, the big problems of the world are never going to be solved. Someone who's trying to find a cure for cancer, they don't turn around and say, hey, mom, am I close? So the stories with holes is meant to have kids have practice in looking at things that are a little bit outside the box. One of the messages I want to deliver, right now in education, and it, it, what keeps happening is there are things that get said that are not true. But one of the things that is true is if you tell a lie a million times, people began to think of it as true. So one of the things that's been happening is with creative writing. The myth is that for a kid to be a great creative writer, they need to think of everything themselves. And we know that's not true. All writers who write basically have tools at their disposal. So one of the things in the school I was principal and all the kids in our district who are involved in both the gate program and not a non-gate program, we basically provided them with lists. So what you have in front of you now, there are two description checklists. Can I get that just go down? And in one one of the description checklists is a character checklist. So the one you're looking at is an event checklist. So the character checklist says, did you include the height, weight, hair color, hair texture, hairstyle, 
eye color, shape of eye, shape of nose, shape of mouth, hand size, foot size, cleanliness, jewelry, clothing worn. So the point is when kids have something like this, they're much more prolific. Otherwise, we see a lot of our kids just sitting and looking at a blank page. So the event checklist, if they have to write a summary, they take out their event checklist. What action took place? How long did it take? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Who was there? So one of the myths that I'd like to expose, even though many of you already know it's been exposed, is for our kids to be better writers, we need to provide them with tools. So this comes from the book, Not Just Schoolwork. Uh, there's tons of other activities in there that work as well. An another book I use for this type of thing is a book called Act One. And I'm going to give you a sample of a page, a page that I didn't give you that I use in my workshops. It's similar. We need, we need the Act One page. I don't know what we did. We're looking at the wrong summary. Okay, so if, if this is a page from Act One, the page I did not give you that I use in my workshops that also does a similar thing. It says, why do people show fear? Talk to five children that are about your age, five children older than you, and five adults. Ask each person what he or she fears. List their fears in the appropriate column below. So the children have a column that says children my age, older children, adults. Now the reason I start off with this when I work with gifted children Many of our children are reluctant writers. If you have children who are reluctant writers, two things work when nothing else works. One, get your children to make lists. Who are your best friends? Where are places you wish you could go? What are, what are things you like to eat? The same child won't write a three paragraph essay, will make a list. So getting our kids to write lists is something that works. The second thing that works get them to do interviews. So they, I can't tell you how often as a school principal, I had kids in my office say, Mr. Levy, tell me again why you want to be a school principal. And they're writing away as I'm answering their questions. So get, getting kids to take notes, they can even interview professional athletes. They don't have to be there, they can be imaginary. Then it says, compare these lists. Circle any fears that show up in all age groups. Suggest reasons why this may be true. So the children write their conclusions. Now, after they write their conclusions, this is what I train the teachers to say to them. Congratulations, you have just completed a research project. And is now a research is having a hypothesis, checking it out, and then drawing a conclusion. So one of the things that's important with gifted kids get them learning before they know they're learning. And that's all about the whole theory of engagement. If we don't get our gifted kids engaged, we're nowhere. And so the stories with holes are very effective because they get kids engaged. The, the act one and the not just school work also get kids engaged. But I want to show you something. I'm going to use this, the sample I used and I'll come back to the one you have right in front of you. When Christopher Columbus came, came to America, <coughs> what would the men on his ship say they were afraid of? So what did you see me do with, with this activity? I made a connection to history. Let's try current events. If we went to Afghanistan now, we spoke to children your age, what would they say they were afraid of? Current events. Let's try a little science. When you get physically afraid, what physiologically happens to your body? So the key, if you're going to reach gifted kids, first get them engaged, then make connections. The difference between a great first-year teacher and a great experienced teacher, first-year teacher gets kids all excited. The experienced teacher gets them excited, but then connects it to where they want to go. So now looking at the one that's in front of you, Think of happy times in your life when you were having fun, what makes something fun, list things that are fun to you. So the way I do, I do this one is I have kids do that first part individually. Then it says, they have, now we ask some other people what is fun for them. 
And so what they do is they get in groups of three to five and they list what other people said was fun that they didn't. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but then we get to the next part where it says, what conclusions can you make about having fun? So we're back to the research. And again, when you laugh, what physiologically happens to your body? What are things that make you laugh? So the key for a great teacher who's working with gifted children, you have to know where you want to go. So before I move us on to one more thing, to, to my test booklet of basic knowledge, let me get that up so at least you can see it. Oh, well, maybe I won't get it up. Okay. Uh, I, as a principal, I, I used to have a volunteer group of kids who worked in my gifted group. And I used to have somewhere like probably about 70 kids in my volunteer group. And I was kidding around with them one day and I, I said to them, name a city in France. And one of the children said, Mr. Levy, we didn't study that. I got so angry at the children in my school, I created a test that the children in my school had to take. Uh, they had to pass the test so they didn't get the report cards at the end of fifth grade. And they started taking the grade in grade two. So what I did, I put things in this test that I expected my own children. I have four daughters. Uh, they're not kids anymore, but they're daughters. And that I thought they, they would know. And so I created this test booklet. But... Let me, I want to explain the difference between the three types of thinking. I'll do that in a minute. So, for example, first question is list America's 13 colonies. Then name four wars fought in the United States. Who's the first president? Who was the president during the Civil War? Who's the current president? How many continents are there? How many oceans are there? Name, a, name two New England states. Name two Western states. In what state is Los Angeles, Dallas, Miami, San Francisco, New York City, Chicago? Now, are these things you'd expect kids to know? Well, yeah, you do. So if you got to look at the book, you would see that almost everything in here are things we expect our kids to know. But now they know, they need to know just like that. Now, what does this relate? how does this relate to gifted? Many times our gifted, here's one of those myths that I'd like to take on. There's a myth going on now, and here, let me give you the two of them. One myth is that kids don't need any basic knowledge anymore because they could look everything up on the internet. You cannot have a conversation if you don't know what things are. So if somebody's wearing glasses and somebody says, well, what's that thing on her eyes? And the kid says, well, I don't know, it's something. You think they're stupid. And we want to help our kids understand no, there are things we expect them to know. And not only do they need to know them, they need to know them just like that. Let me, let me use the presidents as a good example. Do we expect every child in America to know who the first president of the United States was? There, there are very few, if any, children who don't know that it's Washington. Now, does, do almost all the children in the United States know who the 16th president was or the president during the Civil War? Yeah, they absolutely know Lincoln. But watch, who is the president who followed Rutherford B. Hayes? Well, do we, know, do we know who that is? No, not off the top of our heads, but can you look it up? See, if you can look something up, it's convergent thinking. So we want to help our kids understand the difference of the three types of thinking, and teachers especially. When you're teaching a child something that's cultural literacy, if they don't know it, just tell them. And it doesn't, don't confuse deep, that's another myth, that in order for kids to know anything, they have to have deep level understanding. No, there are a lot of people, I know the names that I don't really know what they did. I'll give you a bad example. Almost every kid in fourth, fourth grade and above knows who Moby Dick was. Would you expect your kid, and if you're sitting there and say, well, I don't know who Moby Dick is, I'm sorry. But 
do, do they all know Moby Dick was a big white whale? Sure. Have they read Melville? No. So there's a deal. cultural literacy just means you have the knowledge base. It doesn't mean you have the deep level understanding of what it is. So if I said to you, what are the colors of the rainbow, which is one of the questions in the book? Well, almost all of you have heard of Roy G. Biv. Now, does that mean you understand why rainbows are formed? No, that's a whole different level. But our kids do need a sense of basic knowledge. And again, going back to the, to the types of thinking, let me put them up. So the three types of thinking I'm talking about, and this is true in every subject, there are things that kids, there's a right answer. There are lots of things that kids can have a right answer to. So if there's a right answer, you either teach them how to look it up, how to find it, or you give them the right answer. And one of the things that's going on now with technology is that gifted kids are confusing finding an answer with, with divergent thinking. They are not the same. I can't tell you how many kids in, in my, I had a very highfalutin school right, right outside of Princeton. And our, our kids, confused looking up the answer with thinking and we had to help them understand there's a difference to solve real problems you're going to have to think and but then the third type of thinking is cultural literacy so the cultural literacy basically says yeah there are things you need to know immediately and you can't have a conversation if somebody doesn't know what glasses are you can't talk about that i'd love to take some questions now from anybody who has them, if we can get them through. Nathan, I don't, I don't know if you're able to see um, the chat panel. If not, I can always read you. I, I saw one question come in that would probably be at the okay. end of your chat panel. Okay, it's the end of our, we'll try to find it. Can, uh, but if other people have questions, can you suggest can I suggest them that they ask now? Absolutely, yes. For those of you who are logged in, if you have a question for Nathan up to this point before he continue, continues on with his presentation. Um, or something you want me to touch on. Yeah, anything anything that you have a question about that you already covered or are looking for, please feel free to submit it in the chat panel. I, wait, I lost the question. Somebody had a question up and I lost it. Do do I need to click on the chat box? Yes. Yeah, you can click on the chat box. Oh, okay. So you see the questions now. Some of the questions. All right, let's see. There's a question here. Can we get a quick definition of divergent thinking? The quick definition of divergent thinking is basically thinking outside the box, open-ended thinking, creative thinking. They all translate into divergent thinking. So different people have different names. The big problem I wanted to take on, what's happening in gifted programs all over the country is we're throwing out everything but creative thinking. And that's really not what we need. Our kids, gifted kids need to be able to do all three types of thinking. So the quick definition is basically um, creative thinking, thinking outside the box, open-ended thinking. As a math teacher, what suggestions do you have? is a question. Uh, the, just in general, when I worked with large groups related to gifted, I basically say when you're talking about gifted children, you're talking about gifted children and math. They're two entirely different approaches. So when people have big fights about gifted, it's all, often because one person's thinking about math and the other person's not. The one thing that we know about math if you're working with gifted kids is you must accelerate there's a, there's this big fight in gifted about the difference between excel acceleration and enrichment that no they you should accept well in math most math genius is often developed by the time of somebody is 25 years old so that means that they whereas in other areas it's 40s so basically, if you're in math, you must accelerate. If kids can go further, have them go further and faster, yeah, you can't leave them with huge gaps. So you have to take care of that as well. 
If you want to do a follow-up question, you might try that after. Let me see what other questions I have here. We do not have pull-out or separate gifted programs. Do these types of activities work in mixed class settings and allow gifted students to have the opportunity to be more creative? All types of settings work. Uh, the school I was in, we had people visiting us where I ran the gifted program. Uh, we had people coming from all over the world to see our gifted program, and technically we had no gifted program. But our gifted children were challenged both in the class and through opportunities that, where they could sh display their gifts and talents. So you don't need to have a separate program to reach the needs of gifted children. Uh, so and in terms of these types of activities work in mixed, the answer is yes, they absolutely work in mixed class settings. And not, not only that, the, the key is the teacher's ability to have a sense of where kids are and when, they, when you work with them, give them challenge at the level that will challenge them. You can almost give the same assignment sometimes but have differing levels of expectation in, ter in terms of dealing with them in the classroom. So I hope I gave a little bit of an answer towards that. How do you suggest helping gifted students with anxiety? It's funny you asked about that. Uh, I, I work with a group now that deals with trauma. And I just wrote a book called Trauma in the Classroom, Dealing with Trauma in the Classroom. I'm not sure that's the exact title. It's not out for three weeks. But the whole idea of anxiety, the, the key, your classroom doesn't have to be the world. So what you want to do is create what I call a safe haven in your classroom. So when we have kids who are anxious, yeah, the key is you want to help them feel more comfortable, but not only by saying, I hope you're comfortable, but just helping them know what it feels like to achieve something, to do something, and to remind them that they were nervous, but look, they still were able to do it. There, and a lot depends on the level of anxiety. Uh, what, what I'm finding more and more now, uh, we end up having feeling that our kids are so nervous about everything that we're almost afraid to teach them. But what I find, the people we've trained, it's amazing how comfortable the kids feel in the classroom <coughs> and in the school setting. That doesn't mean they don't get anxious, but they learn how to deal with it in ways that are teaching related rather than psychologically related. So basically that's my, what is cultural literacy? Uh, cu cultural literacy, uh, cultural, cultural, isn't cultural literacy a form of convergent thinking, just like math and science are? The answer is yes and no. The difference between cultural literacy and convergent thinking, <coughs> excuse me, cultural literacy is you expect people to know it almost without thinking. So everyone knows Washington. Everyone knows that Paris is in France. But do we, do we, know, the, do we know the capital of, of Denmark? Maybe. But you wouldn't expect it. So cultural literacy are just things we expect people to know. So it, in my day and age, you would expect everyone to know, have heard of a guy named Barry Manilow. Right? So I said, well, who's he? Well, now they might not, but then you did. And so if someone said Beyonce now, would you expect someone to know who that is? Yeah, she's cultural literacy. You don't have to even be interested in, in singing or rock and roll or anything to know who Beyonce is. So the idea of cultural literacy says these are kids you expect kids to know. If they don't know, you tell them right away. All right, as to math, you believe acceleration is more, no, I, No, I didn't say, somebody, right, the question that was written to me, as to math, you believe acceleration is more important than enhancing and or creative project enhancing. No, I do not. What I'm saying is you must accelerate. I'm not saying that the, what you do when you accelerate, you still do the other thing. Give them pure math and take them forward, taking on advanced math versus enhancing the grade level math. 
I hope I'm making sense. Well, you, you, the person who hopes they're making sense, the, it, the argument isn't enrichment versus acceleration. If you accelerate, you still need to enrich. But the problem is when you only think of enriching, then you hold back some kids who probably could do math at two or three grade levels above. So again, math is a separate world. Please invite me to a district to share a workshop on math. I'd love to come. My gifted child is a perfectionist, which causes her anxiety. Thanks. Uh, I, I, I actually wrote a book called Perfectionism. I look on my website that we gave you earlier. But the, the difference in what they now know about perfectionism, and I'll give you my, what I call a levyism. The levyism, don't let the perfect drive out the good. Lots of us are perfectionists. And what we used to say before the research was revised is that it's bad to be a perfectionist. It isn't true. There's nothing wrong with being a perfectionist. It's only if being a perfectionist makes it impossible for you to do the things you need to do. So uh, the analogy I use, uh, I can clean bathrooms better than anyone else in the whole world. I'm the best bathroom cleaner ever. I get, I get these, I have these little scrub brushes and I get in my bathroom and three, four hours later, it is spotless. But the question is, should I be spending three or four hours cleaning my bathroom? So if I don't, I'm not happy with my bathroom. But if I do, I've wasted all this time. I should be spending writing books or doing workshops. So when you're talking about perfectionism, it's okay to be perfectionistic uh, in terms of when the anxiety gets away, you want to work on the anxiety. If you get a chance to take a look at the book, there'll be some suggestions. Someone says, define accelerate. Accelerate means to, to skip a grade, to, to do math at a higher level, do writing at a higher level, to work at a higher, with higher level kids. It could be anything like skipping a grade or two grades, so any, anything like that. Or if it's a sport, playing with kids at an, at an older age than you might play normally. And I'm going to do one more question. I don't see any more questions. How and Nathan, we have, about 20, we have about 20 minutes left, so if you wanted to maybe continue on and then we can take questions at the end as yep, well. I want we'll to share a few, a few more minutes. things. Okay. okay. I the, the big thing I wanted to share were the three types of thinking. So when you teach any subject, you're teaching convergent, divergent, and cultural. They're all involved in everything you teach. The other thing I wanted to share, one, one of the things I just learned to have, and they come from a book called Thinking and Writing Activities for the Brain. And one, one of the ways you help gifted kids learn, so here's an example of a quote. In this world, there are only two tragedies. One is not getting what one wants, and the other is getting it. That was, that was quoted from Oscar Wilde. Now, class discussion. Don't get what you want, want what you get. Then you will get what you want. Write at least two paragraphs with, with the title, Too Much of a Good Thing. So part of what we want to be able to do is give our kids a chance to really look at bigger thoughts, bigger ideas. Let me find another quote. Oh, this, this is what might create a problem for you. So you might not want to use this. <laughs> Rules are for when brains run out. Ways to rule, class discussion, ways to rule with no rule. How rules make you dependent. Write a paragraph about how you would act if there were no rules. Write about a time you broke a rule. Write about a rule not yet made for which there is a need. So all of these involve both creative thinking So many worlds, so much to do. So little done, such things to be. Alfred Lord Tennyson. From where does potential come? A person is free to be anyone and do anything. Explain the differences between possible 
and actual. So one of the things that I recommend with gifted children is you want to make sure you you can use things that get them thinking, but also things that may stick. So like the, the beauty of quotes is that a, a quote it, it take, says a lot in a little. Let me share one more before I move us on to one more thing. Just when I thought I knew all the answers, they changed all of the questions. Create a list of five things you now know. Write a letter to an infant giving him or her advice on how to make it in this world. So one of the things I guess I'm suggesting is we want our gifted kids to start thinking about things because they're gonna face a world where we don't even know the problems they're gonna face, let alone the answers. And when we're educating gifted children, the reason we even give such a high priority to them is they're the ones who are going to save us. They're the ones who are going to solve these problems. And one of the things that we still don't fully em embrace is that our, our kids really have to learn to solve problems in groups. And one of the things we know about gifted children, to individualize for gifted children, they periodically have to be brought together. So if we, so, so if we don't bring them together, and when you, when you do, when, so when you deal with gifted children, you're going to have to get them thinking, but have them learn to work through frustration. If they quit every time they run into a problem, many of us gifted kids have become masterful at getting adults to do the work for them. And the minute they run into a roadblock, they quit. And we're going to have to work with them on not quitting. So... I, I touched the, I, I wasn't planning to touch on math. <coughs> and one of the things with science, science is going to be a key to success in the future, but so is art. If there's a series of books, if Picasso had a Christmas tree, if Picasso went to the zoo, that are, that are on our website that also deal with different ways you can look at art. And more and more, let me, let me give you a statement that somebody said to me about three years ago, and I laughed, and now I agree with them. They said, art is the new reading. And many of our gifted kids can see things artistically that don't read as well as they might, but they see vision, visuals. And so we want to open up kids to art, and going back to science, there's a big connection between science and art. So that whole STEM move to STEAM, really makes sense. And if you look at a lot of the designs that people do, some of them you almost need, could, can measure. So I don't think of myself as having any artistic ability, but the poem I read to you to start, there are those. Uh, if, you, if you get a chance and you can look at it, there's art in it. And the person was the art teacher in the school where I was principal, and she created this magnificent art with it. So, I don't know, I, this is relatively new for me to work without an interactive audience. So, I have, I think, 10 minutes left, and I, I'm really going to need to take a question or two that'll help me focus on what else you want me to connect with. Great. I did see one question just come in. Out of all your volumes of stories with holes, are any of them geared towards specific grade levels or ages? No. Uh, there, there's a 21st volume is actually coming out in another month or so. Uh, but of all the 21 volumes, no, like the story I did with you uh, that I showed you earlier, can we bring that up again? The first, the story I did, the stories with holes? Yes, I can go to that slide. Okay. Let me find that real quick. So the simple answer is no. Within each book, there's a range of stories. 
And I, I want to. Right, so looking at the, the John and Mary story. Okay, that's it. If you look at that story, could you not do that with a group of eight-year-olds? Because once you break through that John and Mary aren't human, it's 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 almost nothing to solve it. But I've done that with Mensa groups that have taken uh, an, 45 minutes, and I've done it with third graders who did it in 10 minutes. So the simple answer, no, but some stories will be too hard. And the only other time you're going to run into a problem with the stories with holes is when you, you realize none of the children in your class have the background. So this story, with John, if somebody didn't know that a fish out of water would drown, would die, excuse me, die, not drown, would die, then they couldn't solve this story. But you assume that everybody knows that if a fish is out of water, it won't be able to live. So they're not graded. I actually tried that once and I couldn't. Is, are there any other questions? I, I, can't, I can't see it. Somebody. Wait, I have to try to read a question. There was one. Do you have videos modeling the stories with holes in the classroom? Any video resources? No, but I'm willing to come to any place who wants me. No. Well, the the question also is, what, what is your opinion of music with gifted students? It's an absolute essential. Music is a key, and there are kids who will come out musically who don't come out any other way, and there are kids whose lives become music. There's an expression from Lincoln Center. It says, music is not enough for a lifetime. Wait, a lifetime is not enough for music. Wait, music is not enough for a lifetime but a lifetime is not enough for music. Something like that. I messed it up. But in any case, the whole idea is music's very important. The books for third graders and up, not just schoolwork, act one, thinking and writing activities for the brain, a book called Creativity Day by Day. Uh, any of you are welcome to call me on my telephone. I still use a telephone. Uh, my phone number is 732-605. 1643. So if you have questions and you want to call, I'd be glad to talk to you individually. Uh, and also, if you email, I'll try to get back to you that way. The videos, my music we talked about, books recommending. Nathan, any other information you want to provide them about? Um, this slide here about all three types of thinking are important to gifted learners. The myth is that only yeah, creative do, when you're, is important. When you're teaching, do we want kids to be, become more creative? Absolutely. But it's not only creativity. They still need a base of knowledge. And they also need to be able to find knowledge. So what I, I'll give you a terrible example. I was in a school district, and I did a demonstration for them on creative teaching. And when, as I was working with the children, the children did not know the city they lived in. So I proceeded to change my lesson and teach the kids what city they lived in and what state they lived in. And at the end, the people in the gifted program said, we don't have time to teach that. To me, that was absurd. You can't not have time to teach things that the kids absolutely need to know. Kids need to know what city they're in. They need to know what state they're in. They need to know that H2O means water. They need to know they breathe air. I mean, there are so many things they, they do need to know. But there are some things they absolutely need to know. And some, well, you can let them look it up. Do they need to know the, the state capital of every state? No. But they need to recognize if they see the word Wisconsin, that it's a state. So. But what's happening in gifted, at least in places I'm seeing, that everybody's throwing out the baby with the bathwater, and they're saying the kids just need to learn to be creative, nothing else counts. The, the myth in our district is that only convergent thinking is important. Well, you're correct, that's a myth. Now, if, if they have to know how to think, otherwise they're not gonna know what to do. We have this big problem in schools now uh, based on the danger. Don't you think the kids have to learn to think about what 
might happen or how to deal with it. They can't just, you can't just have rules because all the rules won't work. What is your fee to visit schools? I charge a fortune, but I will come to anybody if I, we can find a date that works in my calendar, just call and we'll work it out. Uh, is this webinar being recorded? I think so. Yes, it, it is being recorded, and the recording will be emailed out later this week. It will also be uploaded to our our gate website. I, I was I was just in Phoenix, Arizona, from the person who asked if you call and you set it up. Uh, I, I I come to Phoenix pretty regularly, so I'd love to come again. Just call. How do we allow for gifted creativity with subjects such as basic grammar? Well, don't basic grammar is basic grammar. It's not a creative subject. A period comes at the end of a sentence. A question mark comes at the end of a sentence. The sentence begins with a capital. See, basic grammar is not a creative endeavor. So that's the difference. Can you use grammar creatively? Yes, to make different sentences, sure. Yeah, there's a book called Eats, Shoots, and Leaves. And it all depends on the punctuation on what the, the cover means. What are some strategies for incorporating all three types of thinking in a typical day lesson plan? That's one of the other things that's a mythology. You cannot plan to do everything every day. Uh, the key is to plan it over time. So you might emphasize creative thinking over a two or three day period. You might emphasize uh, acquisition of knowledge over a two or three day period. Not everything gets put into every lesson every day. And that's why it's one of the myths of trying to plan day to day. You need a long-term plan as well as a short-term plan for your gifted program and for all your programs. So there might be a day where you just focus on one thing. That doesn't mean it was a bad day teaching. But if every day you only focus on one thing and it's always the same type of thing, yeah, that's a problem. What's our, do I have more we have, time? We have, to, we have about four minutes. Okay. So maybe a what couple are more thoughts questions. On, what are your thoughts on the push for project-based learning? Project-based learning is brilliant, but basically the key is to make the project a real project. So the whole idea of project-based learning is for it to be authentic learning. So if kids are doing a project, it's because it's of interest. It's because if they, if they work through it. And through your, it, the whole idea of project-based learning is that kids learn through their interest. So I have a theory that Super Bowl week is the best week in the world to teach. Because the kids think they're, they're talking about the Super Bowl all week, and you're teaching them math, geography, science, all the things related to the Super Bowl. So project-based learning is just basically a way by getting kids interested and focused to teach them reading, writing, thinking, math, science. So do you have, I think I, is there one more question? Will, I, will I be able to get a list of all these questions? Yeah, and there's one last question. Do you have ideas on how to support students that are gifted but don't do well on standardized tests, which have become part of the student's ability level? You know, you will not like my answer. Teach them how to take a standardized test. So one of the things that I did when I had kids like that, and I had a lot of kids like that in New York City, uh, what I did was I taught them how to take a test. And th those are really convergent. And what we want to be able to do is teach kids how to remove everything that's not the actual test from the test. So they understand how to make educated guesses. They understand how to read a question. They understand if it's a right there question, they should be able to answer all of those. If it's a question that draws for a conclusion, then they have to see which is the best conclusion. We can, we're fighting something we shouldn't be fighting. <coughs> our, our gifted kids should learn how to take a test instead of freaking out about it, see it as an, as an interesting challenge. We, we've taken the wrong stance on testing. We've let the test rule us instead of us ruling the test. So again, you don't have to agree with things I say. I'm, I'm only a consultant. I'm not your principal. Go back and listen to your principals. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anything else I can 
Touch I think that's Wiley. all the questions we have right now. Again, if you have a question, if you're logged in, or if you think of a question after the webinar, please feel free to email it to me. My email address is listed on this slide. I also left, Nathan was kind enough to leave his office number, so I left that in the chat panel if any of you want to contact him to Can get I more information. Can I do a closing statement? Absolutely. Okay. Basically, just so we don't lose track, children are children. And whether they're gifted or not, every child is important. However, gifted children are not only important for themselves, they're important for the rest of the world as well. So all of our children are blessed and all of our children, we want to make sure we do the best we can to help them be as good as they can be. And the other thing that I, I think you want to keep under your hat as, as a thought, learning is really interesting and fun. If we, we're, we're not the enemy when we're trying to teach kids. We're really trying to open them up to this world of interest. Learning is fascinating. And if we could help even our toughest kids realize that, we just have to help them understand that what they think they want to learn can connect to what they can also learn that's important. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to go back to throwing snowballs, and I hope you all have a good time, whoever you are. And the Phoenix Great. person would love to hear from you. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Nathan, for sharing your knowledge with us on strategies and ideas to help students become better creative and critical thinkers. I'd also like to thank all of you for logging in tonight and for joining us. Um, if you haven't already, please feel free to register and I hope you'll join us on next week on the same day and time as we continue our series with Genius Hour. Um, if you haven't already, please feel free to register for that webinar. And if you are also interested in earning credit for this webinar series, please feel free to contact me. I left my um, email address on the slide. Feel free to shoot me an email and I can go ahead and get that enrollment, credit option enrollment form over to you. Thank you again so much for your participation and have a great night, everyone.